Tonight, on a very special episode of Ask a Mortician, we are at the historic Greystone Mansion in Beverly Hills. How did we get permission to film here after dark? I'll never tell. I've already said too much. You may recognize this mansion from Spider-Man, X-Men, The Witches of Eastwick. There will be blood. If I have a milkshake, and you have a milkshake, and I have a straw, and my straw goes all the way into your milkshake, I drink your milkshake, boy. Gilmore Girls and Meatloaf's I Would Do Anything for Love, But I Won't Do That music video. And I would do anything for love Except get copyrighted on YouTube So I'm singing it like this I had that album on cassette tape. But perhaps most importantly, it was the mortuary in The Loved One. In Hume-Munt, in Tomb-Munt, in Urn-Munt, in Muir-Munt, some people just lately have preferred in sarcophagus -munt. It's very individual. It's very individual. But we're not here for the mansion. We're here for murder. Before this was a major filming set, it was the site of one of the most notorious murder suicides of the 20th century. It had everything. Intrigue, high profile people, corruption, fame, a taboo love affair. But the question we want to answer in our continuing series on death in Los Angeles is why are some houses seemingly condemned by a death and some houses glamorized by it? But first, the murder. In 1892, Edward Doheny was down on his luck, practically penniless. But then he struck oil in the tar fields of Los Angeles and became a tycoon overnight, controlling fields in California and Mexico and becoming one of the richest men in the world. Because of that, his son, Edward Jr., or Ned Doheny, grew up surrounded by wealth and privilege. Well, his mother did die by suicide or was murdered by swallowing battery acid, but other than that, life was great for young Ned. When Ned was 20, he met Theodore Hugh Plunkett. The two men became the best of friends, and Hugh started working as a chauffeur for the Doheny family. They served in World War I and returned to Los Angeles. Hugh would become Ned's trusted secretary, deeply involved in the business dealings of the Doheny family, which was not a great idea for Hugh. In the 1920s, the Doheny family became embroiled in the Teapot Dome scandal. Before Watergate and no collusion, the Teapot Dome scandal was the most sensational scandal in American politics. Now, this isn't Ask a Mortician about the Teapot Dome scandal, but long story short, it involved oil barons bribing the Secretary of Interior for secret oil rights. And, of course, one of those oil barons was Edward Doheny, who roped in his son Ned and the trusted secretary Hugh. Ned and Hugh were the men who quite literally delivered the bribe to the secretary of interior, in a black bag, in cash. A government investigation is launched, everyone is put on trial. Ned and Hugh are supposed to testify, but Ned is given immunity for his testimony, while Hugh was not. Now, as an aside, during this time, Pa Doheny, Doheny Sr., has built a fantastic mansion, this one, for his son Ned and his wife Lucy. It's 67 rooms, almost $4 million, designed by the same man who designed the Hoover Dam, and at the time, the most expensive home in California. So the trial is looming. The Doheny's have a fabulous Great Gatsby-style Christmas party, while Hugh Plunkett, according to the Doheny's, by the way, is having a complete mental breakdown. They try to get him to check into a mental hospital, but he's not having it, allegedly. Later that same night, Hugh shows up at Greystone Mansion, letting himself in. Ned and Hugh sit down to have a drink in this room. And that's where the mystery begins. According to Lucy, Ned's wife, she hears a gunshot while she's reading magazines, but instead of calling the police, she calls the family doctor, Dr. Fishbaugh. According to Lucy and Dr. Fishbaugh, they come to this door and find Hugh Plunkett with the door partially ajar. He says, you get out of here, and slams it. And 
That's when they hear the second gunshot. Fishbaugh said that he saw the bodies of Ned and Hugh on the floor, both shot in the head, but still no one called the police until midnight. According to this story, Hugh first shot Ned in the head and then shot himself. But to the forensic investigator, some things weren't exactly adding up. Fishbaugh claimed that Ned was already dead when he entered the room, but the blood from the bullet wound moved up and across Ned's face. If Ned had just fallen to the ground, the drip pattern wouldn't look like that. When pressed, Fishbaugh said, well, actually, Ned was alive when he entered the room for about 20 minutes and he moved the body, but then he moved it back to the exact original place. Okay, doctor. Then there's the gun. When investigators arrived on the scene, the gun, a 45 Colt revolver, was still extremely warm. They tried to fire it several times to get it to heat up in the same way, but they couldn't get it to match. It was like the gun had been purposely warmed in an oven. Additionally, there were no fingerprints on the revolver, not even smudges, which could only happen if the revolver had been wiped clean. But perhaps the most damning were the gunpowder burns. Ned's head had gunpowder residue around the bullet hole, indicating it had been shot from about three inches away. Hugh, on the other hand, did not have any powder burns around the bullet hole. If he had been shooting himself at close range, as in a suicide, there would have been powder burns. The investigator did not believe that Hugh had shot Ned and then shot himself. The physical facts and the testimony of the witnesses do not jive, he said. Ah, so naturally a huge investigation is launched and the true culprit is found. No, actually, the investigation was closed after two days, probably due to the political influence of the Doheny family. In their version of events, Ned was this kindly man just trying to help a mentally ill friend. Another very important layer to this was all the press speculation that Ned and Hugh were lovers, having an affair, and the deaths were part of a lover's pact or a lover's quarrel. The press went to town on this salacious gossip, and the teapot dome angle was swept under the rug a bit, which is interesting, I think. Ned wasn't buried in his family's plot in a Catholic cemetery, which is weird because they were big Roman Catholics and donated a lot to the church. Ned was buried in the privately owned Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, and Hugh was buried only a hundred feet away. One way to speculate about this is that Ned had actually died by suicide, a mortal sin in the Catholic Church, and thus couldn't be buried in a Catholic cemetery. And that's the story of the murder house. Okay, murder mansion. Which is interesting because none of these can ever really be confirmed or denied. Greystone Mansion is haunted by its bloody past, and also literally haunted if you choose to believe the internet. But I wouldn't call this a dark tourist destination. If anything, it's more well known for its old Hollywood extravagance and the films that were shot here. But let's acknowledge a cultural truth here. We're not going to stigmatize this house because we're enchanted, not horrified at glamorous old Hollywood murders. But if it's not in Hollywood, no dice. Take another beautiful home in an affluent neighborhood, 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, New York. In 1974, Ronald DeFeo Jr. murdered his entire family with a rifle while they slept. Following the murders, the Lutz family moved into the house, alleging unimaginable hauntings and spawning what most of us know as the Amityville Horror. To this day, it's still the dreaded Amityville house. Many other people have lived there after the DeFeo murders, but no other horrors have been reported. Owners have said it's a nice place to live. Here it is on Realtor.com. Two beautiful homes that each had one bad murderous night, but one turned out grim and the other glittering. If anything, the murders at Greystone Mansion seem to add to the home's glamour. Why? One reason might be that the Dohenies were celebrities. They were like the Brad and Angelina of their time, flying all over the world, living extravagantly. They were everything the public wanted to have and wanted to be. The Dohenies were basically characters in their own movie. I mean, they practically lived on a movie set, meaning their lives and crimes were fodder for entertainment. 
When Ned and Hugh were killed, it was a climactic moment in what was already a great story. And just like with any Hollywood royalty, we love them, but we also like to see them fall. It doesn't make them any less fabulous, but for a moment, we get to feel superior. Take the University of Southern California admissions scandal that's happening right now. Fun fact, Ned Doheny went to USC. Were you on the crew team, Ned? Something about seeing the ultra-rich get caught trying to game the system with their wealth gives people a sense of satisfaction. A sense of, you're not better than me, Aunt Becky. The Doheny story is more Hollywood than most movies. The house remains as a reminder of a family that flew too close to the sun and lost their lives. But it's also a reminder of how grand life can be. In Hollywood, a tale as old as time. This video was made with generous donations from death enthusiasts just like you. I'm not saying they were gay, of course. These are the tiles in their bathroom, but I don't like to speculate.